Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar titled Sorting Out the Mechanisms of Endocytic Recycling. This webinar is part of the Cell Biology Virtual Event and I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots. So let's get started. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that this event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the ask a question box and click send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, just click on that ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits tab, um, credits. Click on the continuing education credits tab located on the top right corner of your presentation window and follow those processes to get those credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Steve Kaplan, Professor and Vice Chair for Administration Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and the Director of UNMC Advanced Microscopy Core Facility at the Research Institute, and he's also the Program Coordinator. For a complete biography of our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Kaplan, welcome. You may now begin your presentation, sir. Okay, hello. Um, thank you for the introduction and good afternoon to everyone. Um, today I will be taking through a little bit of a journey that goes and looks at uh, basic mechanisms of trafficking through the cell. And we'll be discussing in particular uh, mechanisms that control uh, the recycling of receptors from the plasma membrane, um, or receptors back to the plasma membrane from inside the cell. So first off, um, a little bit of a plug for basic science in these days when uh, a lot of the science that you hear about um, tends to be uh, what we call translational and focused exclusively on disease research. And I'm a big proponent of uh, basic biomedical science and curiosity-driven science. And Arthur Kornberg, Nobel Prize recipient back in 1959 said, um, no matter how counterintuitive it may seem, basic research has proven over and over to be the lifeline of practical advances in medicine. Without advances, medicine regresses and reverts to witchcraft. And for this reason, uh, my laboratory and I have been focusing on our basic understanding of membrane trafficking. And to start with, I'll give you a little bit of an overview about the pathways that we study, and then we'll start to focus in and I'll explain in, in more detail about some of the more recent research we've done in our lab. But this research has started out um, as a journey built upon years and years of research uh, by, by many other laboratories. And basically it addresses these trafficking pathways of a receptor such as the TFR or transferrin receptor, which is found on the plasma membrane and it is internalized into the cell when it binds its, its ligand, which is transferrin loaded with iron, and it's internalized into these clathrin-coated pits that you can see. And once the internalization occurs, or once these clathrin-coated pits are formed, um, there's an enzyme, a, basically a, a protein that's involved in the fission of these small coated vesicles, and this fission occurs and a vesicle is released into the cytoplasm and the vesicles end up fusing with the next organelle that you can see along the list, which is the endosome, the early endosome, sorting endosome. Um, and once this occurs, these receptors, in this case, the example I'm using the transferrin receptor, are delivered to the membrane of the endosome and they can undergo a number of different fates depending on what receptor they are. In this case, the transferrin receptor is typically returned back to the plasma membrane um, through mechanisms that involve what we call recycling. And this is the return of vesicles or small tubules containing transferrin receptor right back to the plasma membrane, where it can again undergo uh, binding to its ligand and this cycle can occur again and again indefinitely until 
eventually the receptor undergoes degradation and new receptors replace it on the plasma membrane. However, um, this sorting into the recycling pathway, depending on the receptor and different circumstances within the cell, can also lead the, um, the receptors in the sorting endosome to be sorted to different fates. And the other fate shown here on the left side of the slide to the MVB or multivesicular body, and then on to the lysosome leads to the degradation of these specific receptors. So a lot of the research in, um, in, in the area of, of cell biology and in my lab in particular is focusing on understanding um, the mechanisms by which, number one, receptors are sorted into their various pathways, their various fates for degradation or recycling at the endosome, or, um, or in addition to that, I should say, also the mechanisms by which those vesicles containing the receptors are released from the endosome so that they can be transported to one fate or another fate. And those will be the central questions that I'll be discussing today. Now, key to a lot of these trafficking pathways um, are a lot of different events that occur, obviously, and a, and a big family of proteins known as the RAB family of GTP binding proteins. Uh, you can see a couple of examples of the 60-odd RAB proteins that are known uh, in mammalian cells. Here we have RAB5 and RAB7 and RAB4, and these are proteins that play key and important roles in the, in the transport, in the, first of all, in, the, in forging the identity of the individual endosomal and uh, membrane-bound compartments in the endocytic pathways, but also in controlling the transport from point to point within these compartments. So just as an example, RAB11 is a key protein known to be involved in controlling recycling of receptors back to the plasma membrane. So if we look at transport of um, receptors from place to place within the cell, um, we can look at this snare-based fission, fusion, and transport of vesicles, which brought um, Rothman and his colleagues the Nobel Prize in, in 2014. And this little schematic diagram kind of illustrates for us um, this mechanism in general. So we have on the left the donor compartment, which could be the plasma membrane, but in our case, we're focusing on the endosome. So this would be the endosome. And we have the cargo molecules. They could be soluble cargo that go inside the vesicles, or they could be transmembrane receptors, which is something that we're interested in. And these receptors get into areas that uh, form buds. And you can see these buds have coats around them, which are proteins that coat these areas of lipids that are kind of budding off of the endosome. And at some point they form these sphere, usually spherical structures um, that are the vesicles that will be transported. And they need to undergo what we call scission, scission for scissors or fission. And the fission cleaves off these vesicles with the receptors in the membrane. And they're transported along, usually along microtubules with motor proteins that are attached to them. And they drive these structures along um, to the acceptor compartment, which could be, if this is an endosome, this could be to the back to the plasma membrane and recycling. And there's a process of fusion that occurs as a tethering step, step where these vesicles kind of are, are glued onto the, um, the acceptor membrane by a series of different interactions and protein interactions. And as a result, um, and the RABs play a key role in this, and as a result, other proteins known as snare proteins are involved in allowing these membranes to get close enough and eventually um, intercalate with one another and allow a fusion event between the membranes. And that vesicle then becomes part of the membrane of the acceptor membrane. And the receptor that was in that membrane, the vesicular membrane, is now part of the acceptor compartment, or in this case, if we're looking at it, the plasma membrane. So this is basically how most of the trafficking occurs within cells. So in the course of um, the last couple of decades and the research that, um, that, that I've done and those in my lab have done, in fact, this was still as a postdoctoral fellow about 20 years ago, um, I began to work on a protein, and I won't get into the reasons for this, but a protein that we suspected was involved in some of these uh, pathways and really hadn't been characterized at the time I started to work on it. And one of the first things that we did was look at the localization of this protein within cells. 
At first, we, we cloned the protein or cloned the cDNA and expressed the protein in cells. And we used um, electron microscopy, immunoelectron microscopy, and found the black gold dots that you see in A and the immuno-EM, immunoelectron microscopy, um, surround this tubular-like structure, which uh, essentially is a membrane-bound structure, a membrane-bound tubular structure that is a type of an endosome, which we, we realized um, over time. And when we express this protein as um, in, in immune fluorescence experiments, the black structures that you see in B are a GFP, green fluorescent tag protein of EHD1. And you can see those uh, structures are mostly these tubular structures, um, which really surprised us because for the most part, we expected maybe seeing this on endosomes, but we didn't expect to see it on these very wide and unusual looking um, tubular based structures. And we used a technique which at the time was, was new and has become um, more common in recent years. And this uh, technique is called CLEM or correlative light and electron microscopy. And this little box that you can see in B that uh, shows a part of a tubular recycling endosome in it has been um, used and cut serial sections of that to look at it for electron microscopy. And you can see the black peroxidase dots are surrounding that very same tubule that you can see there in the box. This is the plasma membrane that you can see where it says PM out in the corner. And the M marks a mitochondria to the left of this tubular recycling endosome. And this is not just an artifact of overexpressing, overexpressing um, because we can actually we made an antibody for EHD1 and we can see that it marks in these HeLa cells on the left, it marks tubular and vesicular structures in white now um, that seem to be in an area that's perinuclear or, or very close to the nucleus, or one side of the nucleus at least. So we have a protein that has a, as an unusual localization to these tubular structures uh, for the most part. And we began thinking about these structures over, over the coming years because they're, they're very unusual. And in recent years, there's been more and more attention paid to these networks of tubular structures, which in many cases actually bud out of the early or sorting endosome. And this, uh, this diagram here, this um, cartoon basically shows tubular structures that are coded or marked by various different proteins. In this case, proteins known as sorting nexons, SNCs27, SNCs3, uh, SNCs4 and other SNCs proteins that belong to the retromer complex for the most part. Um, and these are often uh, tubular structures that bud from these endosomes as shown by the work of Peter Cullen and, and others. And um, we um, have began to try and make sense of these tubular recycling endos endosomes and understand what their function is and kind of skipping ahead or giving you a kind of a premonition for where we're going with this, we believe that um, this EHD1 protein is intimately involved, not in generating these tubular recycling endosomes, but in cleaving them and serving as a molecular scissors involved in fission of these structures so that they can allow recycling to occur back to the plasma membrane. So back when we began studying EHD1 and trying to understand its function, we used a rather simple kind of assay to determine if it's involved in membrane trafficking and recycling to the plasma membrane. About the time we, we did these studies, it was work coming out of the lab of uh, Barth Grant at Rutgers University showing that a homolog free HD1 and C. elegans appears to be involved in the recycling um, in uh, colant, uh, in, in basically in cells from the intestine of, of C. elegans. And so this was our hypothesis and we began working on this. And the way that we study this um, is quite simple. We use the same transferrin that I showed you in the very init uh, initial slides. It's um, capable of taking up, uh, being taken up through its receptor, transferrin receptor into cells. And we use a fluorophore labeled transferrin, a dilabeled transferrin that goes into the cells and it goes into the cells. Um, we allow it into the cells for 15 or 20 minutes. 
and then we wash out any non-internalized uh, dilabeled transferrin by adding unlabeled transferrin to the cells. And then we follow how long it takes for the transferrin to disappear from the cells as a measure of recycling. So what you're looking at on the left-hand side are, are cells on the bottom that have taken up transferrin and released their transferrin and basically the recycling has occurred. You can see a little bit of white left in these cells that I've marked with the yellow outline. Um, and on top, this just shows schematically what we're looking at, cells that are basically almost empty of transferrin after about 30 minutes of allowing recycling. We then used what was more or less a relatively new technique at the time, uh, silencing RNA to knock down the levels of EHD1 shown in this Western blot. Um, and you can see that the EHD1 is almost uh, completely gone in the knockdown cells. And then we repeated the same experiment essentially to see what happens to the transferrin that was taken up into the cell. Does it recycle to the same degree? And when we studied this, what we could see in the bottom right, um, you can see that the transferrin, um, the labeled transferrin still bound to its receptor, accumulates within the cells in this perinuclear region, um, in this kind of blob of transferrin. These are endosomes that basically the transferrin hasn't been released from them. And this kind of suggests that EHT1 knockdown um, fails to allow recycling to occur to the same degree that it occurs in, in normal cells and suggests that it plays a role in regulating recycling in a mechanism that at the time we didn't fully understand and I think we're coming to terms with understanding better uh, now and I'll, I'll come to that towards the end of my talk. So just to complicate things, it turns out that there are four proteins with a good degree of homology, uh, really identity to one another that um, are part of a family of proteins in mammalian cells um, called EHD1, 2, 3, and 4. The two closest proteins are EHD1 and EHD3 with about 86% identity at the amino acid level. Uh, many people would say these are almost the same protein essentially, but I will briefly show you that they have what we think are, are different, maybe partially overlapping, but different functions. Um, and I really won't be talking about EHD2 and EHD4 today to any degree. Um, but there are four of them. Um, and this is interesting because in C. elegans and Drosophila, there's only a single um, EHD1, although there are some different isoforms, um, but it's essentially the same protein. In yeast, um, there are no EHD proteins or EHD proteins from the same family at least. Uh, suggesting it's a relatively new evolutionary invention um, in eukaryotic cells. Um, so what is EHD1 and, and what does its uh, domain architecture look like? And if we look at the schematic diagram up on the top left, we can see that this family of proteins has essentially an ATP binding G domain sandwiched between a couple of helical domains and then another domain at the C-terminus, um, which kind of gives the protein its name, which is an EH domain or EPS-15 homology domain, based on its homology to a family of about oh, 35 to 50 different proteins that have a domain that has a similar structure and similar um, or at least uh, homologous amino acid residues. It's about a 100 amino acid domain and it um, is known to be involved um, in binding as a protein binding module. It binds to proteins that contain um, the following tripeptide motif, asparagine, proline, phenylalanine, or NPF. And so it's an interesting uh, protein binding module. Um, the crystal structure was first solved by um, the lab of Harvey McMahon. Um, in Cambridge, and he showed it for the mouse EHD2. And basically what he showed is that there are lipid binding interfaces. There is this ATP hydrolysis domain, binding and hydrolysis domain. And the um, EH domains are kind of adjacent to one another, and they're, they're in a dimeric type of structure. We later uh, solved the um, EH domain by... Um, uh, NMR solution structure um, in order to address some specific questions about the, the EH domain and get a better understanding of how it differs from the EH domains found in other proteins from different families. 
And, uh, and I'll be coming to that in a moment because it's, it's an interesting thing. And so what we found um, is that there are some um, interesting differences between this EH domain um, or actually the four EH domains of these C-terminal EHD family members and um, EH domains in general. And if we take a look at that, um, it allowed us to ask questions about the basis of selectivity for how EHD1, M2, 3, and 4 bind to specific subsets of proteins, whereas other members of the family that have an EH domain um, bind to very different proteins. And so if we take a look at this, um, this is, as I showed you, the um, type of um, domain architecture that we have for the what we call the C-terminal EHT proteins, because the H domain is at the C-terminus, whereas the many other members of this family that have EH domains are N-terminal EHT proteins. They have one or more EH domains at the N-terminus, and they behave very differently because they bind to different subsets of proteins. And why is that the case? And this is one of the questions that we were really interested in. And um, given the structural knowledge that we were able to, um, um, to obtain from the NMR solution structure, um, we were able to come up with an interesting hypothesis. What we found is that if we compare on the right the EH domain of EHD1 with other uh, N-terminal EH domains, we find that there's a lot more blue uh, positively charged residues on the surface of the C-terminal EHD proteins and a lot more negatively charged structures on the surface in the N-terminal EHD proteins. And so if we look at this at a kind of more molecular level and identify maybe six of the key residues on the surface um, that would be involved in the binding, and we look at um, various, in fact, five different um, N-terminal EH domains, we find when we look at the six residues that the net charge is either very mildly positive or negatively charged or close to neutral. Um, when we look at the C-terminal EHD proteins, EHD1, 2, 3, and 4 on the left, and then the Xenopus, Drosophila, C. elegans, um, zebrafish, and Schistosomula EHD proteins, we find each of the EH domains there have very strongly positively charged residues. And that all led us to hypothesize um, something very interesting based on another um, observation that uh, we um, had made. And this observation is that if we look at proteins that we and others have identified that bind to the C-terminal EHDs, EHD1, 2, 3, and 4, we find that after the NPF motif in these proteins that binds to the EH domain, um, they're typically are a number of acidic or negatively charged residues that follow the NPF motif. Whereas proteins that show weak or no binding to the C-terminal EHDs, but do bind to the N-terminal EHDs, typically have very little or no acidic residues that are immediately following the NPF motifs, and that's shown on the bottom. And so this all led us to an interesting hypothesis that perhaps the positively charged surface area of the C-terminal EH domains, EHD1, 2, 3, and 4, um, allows interactions or better interactions with NPF motifs that are followed by negatively charged residues, such as uh, E and D. And that was our hypothesis. And one of the students in my laboratory at the time, Mahek Sharma, who now has a lab of her own, um, she was able to show an interaction between EHD1 and a new protein that hadn't really been um, characterized yet called Mikal l one And interestingly, Mikal l one has not one but two NPF motifs, and one of those NPF motifs, but not the other one, had no less than six acidic residues following the NPF motif. And so that to us was interesting because immediately if we wanted to test our hypothesis we thought that EHD1 may interact with Mikel L1 through the first NPF motif, but not through the second one, because only the first one has the negatively charged residues. Um, and so we tested that by making mutations in Mikel L1 and basically removing the second NPF motif, mutating it to APA instead of NPF, and then 
addressing what happens when we leave the first NPF motif alone or make mutations in it. So we used a GST pull-down system at first to pull down um, either wild-type Mikhail L1, and we could see that it came down nicely in the left lane. Then we pulled down Mikhail L1 with the second NPF motif mutated, the one with no acidic residues, and we find we still get in the second lane very nice pull-down. Um, but when we take that same mutant that has no second NPF motif, and in the first NPF motif change all of the acidic residues to alanine, we lose the vast majority of the binding. And we'd lose a lot of the binding if we change the first three um, acidic residues to alanine, and less, we'd lose less of the binding if we change only the second three to alanine. And we didn't stop there. We did the same type of experiment using the yeast two hybrid system, um, which basically the yeast will grow only if there's an interaction. Um, and what we showed is that EHD1 um, colonies of EHD1 Michael L1 grew when the Michael L1 was wild type. Um, but when we transformed with a Michael L1 lacking the first NPF motif, the one with the acidic residues, there was no uh, growth, therefore no binding. And when we knocked down the second NPF motif and did this, no effect on the binding. So very consistent with uh, what we showed with the GST pull down. And then again, the same thing when we knock down the um, acidic residues, we lose the binding. We knock down the first three acidic residues, lose most of the binding. Um, knock down the second three acidic residues, we lose some, but not all of the binding. So very consistent. And in, um, in agreement with that, we did further NMR titration studies, and I won't go through this, but just say that the uh, titration curves uh, fully support the data uh, from the two hybrid and uh, GST pull-down studies, showing that essentially these acidic residues following the NPF are needed for optimal binding affinity in this assay. And um, in uh, agreement with that also, uh, the group of uh, Jim Belecha at Tufts University also published, uh, about the same time our paper came out, a paper of their own completely independent um, using a fourth system, is a thermal titration calorimetry, and essentially showed um, the same results that we were showing. So we felt very confident to say that the mechanism for selective binding of these C-terminal EH domains on EHD1 and its fellow members um, with um, uh, NPF-containing proteins um, really requires these um, acidic clusters. So in fitting with all of those, um, we have been over the years interested in identifying interaction partners to further understand the function of EHD1 and its partners in regulating endocytic recycling and figuring out how it controls endocytic recycling. And this is a partial list of some of the proteins that we found that interact, we and others have found that interact um, with EHD1 and its partners. And the ones with the stars are ones that we identified. Um, some of them are identified by their labs. And I don't think this is a complete list. Um, and today I'm going to be telling you about a, a new protein that we've identified that interacts with EHD1 independently of the EH domain and NPF motifs. So just to kind of further um, draw out the role that's, that there's now becoming a consensus about for understanding EHD1 and its function, several years ago, um, in collaboration with um, Wei Guo's lab in, um, in the University of Pennsylvania, um, we were trying to understand what EHD1's function was. And some results that we had seemed to suggest that EHD1 may be involved in fission as a vesiculator of these tubular recycling endosomes that, um, that I'm showing you here. So these are tubular recycling endosomes marked by the very protein we discussed, Michal L1. Um, you can see a cluster of cells. There may be 10 cells in this field. Uh, the nuclei are the dark areas. And these white structures that you see are marked by Michal L1. These are what we call the TRE or tuber, tubular recycling endosomes. When we knock down EHD1 um, in these cells, what we see is an expansion of the tubular recycling endosome network. The tubules are longer, 
Um, they're more diverse, they're more um, numerous, and there's a greater volume of these structures in cells. Surprisingly, when we knock down the closest homolog to EHD1, which is EHD3, we see a loss of these structures altogether. And I don't really have time to tell you about EHD3's role today, but we do know that um, EHD3 is involved in controlling or allowing these structures to be uh, maintained rather than involved in their vesiculation. And we can show that if you transfect, um, if you transfect, we're having issues with the slide here. Uh, There we go. So if you transfect EHD1 back into cells that are knocked down for EHD, EHD3, if you transfect the EHD3 back using a mutant that's not knocked down by the siRNA, you can see that it restores the tubules um, that are marked by Mikal L1 in this case. So that's EHD3 is important for the uh, maintenance of these tubular recycling endosomes. Now, how do we study these structures? Um, we study them by uh, quantifying them in a variety of different manners. This particular um, image just shows you how we can um, basically translate what we see by immune fluorescence um, into something that we can measure by image J and we can count the number of tubules in a field of cells, 123 in this case, and the total tubular area um, in two dimensional images as we, we have done here. And what we can basically see is when we knock down the EHD1, and let's ignore the other EHD proteins in this graph. So when we compare the um, mock on the left um, to the EHD1 siRNA, we can see that the count, the number of tubules per field, increases by about twofold with EHD1 knockdown. We see the opposite uh, with EHD3 knockdown. And when we measure the, um, the base, basically the, the, the square area, the micron squared uh, of tubules that we find, the total area, we can see that there's also a two plus fold increase when we knock down the EHD1, suggesting that EHD1 may no longer be trimming or cutting um, these structures. So um, our our, our hypothesis now, and it's, it's basically a hypothesis that many groups now hold, and many groups have, have worked on this, is that EHD1 induces fission. And um, here's another experiment that we, did, we, that we did in collaboration with Wei Guo at Pennsylvania, U Pennsylvania. And basically, it's a simple experiment where we take um, purified EHD1 and we add it to liposomes and do electron microscopy analysis and we add it to liposomes in the presence or absence of ATP. And as I mentioned, it's an ATPase. It needs ATP in order to function, to hydrolyze ATP and um, carry out its enzymatic activity. And so what you can see on the left is a micrograph in A where you've got some large liposomes or larger liposomes with no ATP. When we add ATP, typically the size of these liposomes is decreased due to fission that occurs by EHD1 in the presence of ATP. And through counting many, many um, uh, slides like this, we've come to the conclusion that the um, EHD1 plus ATP, again, decreases the size, the mean size of these liposomes, the diameter by about um, you know, twofold or so. So this is more evidence that it's involved in fission. And our, our essential thoughts are, and I won't go again through this whole idea, but these are the tubular endosomes that we think that to some degree, Mikal L1 and Sindapin may be involved in their generation by binding to phosphatidic acid in data I'm not showing you today. And receptors are sorted along these tubular um, recycling endosomes. And at some point, EHD1 is recruited that's the E recruited through its binding to Mikal L1 and Sindapin and is able to cleave uh, these uh, tubular, endosome, tubular recycling endosomes into vesicles that are now released, allowing for the recycling of uh, receptors back to the plasma membrane. So this is an interesting experiment that really highlights the 
um, the molecular mechanism of VHD1. It was done by the group of Thomas Pukadil um, in, in India, and uh, at Pune in India. And this is a beautiful experiment where he's taken um, membranes that are marked by fluorescent lipids and kind of stretched them along um, into tubules. And by adding EHD1 with purified, uh, purified EHD1 with ATP, what he can show is that over time, um, you start to see, this is 78 seconds in the middle panel here, you can start to see where those arrows are showing areas that are prone to fission, where the EHD1 is involved in the cleavage or the fission of these uh, membrane structures. The other areas shown by white are areas where we get the thickening of the membrane where EHD1 probably accumulates to exert force on the membrane. And this is what, what he shows down below in what he calls his barbell model, where you get the accumulation of EHD1 sitting on both sides of the um, area that is prone to undergo fission. And through hydrolysis activity, ultimately that um, membrane is cleaved, allowing the tubule to break into small tubules or vesicles and allow, as we know, recycling to occur. So there's very strong evidence that EHD1 is involved in fission from, from many groups now. So the question that I really want to talk about today in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so is new data from our lab um, discussing how we think fission, by mediated by EHD1, connects with the sorting of receptors at these endosomes. And so that's the key question. How is sorting mediated? And we know that receptors go into these areas of the endosomal membrane that bud and ultimately undergo fission. And so one of the families of proteins that in recent years has been described as playing key roles in sorting are a family of proteins, um, not uh, surprisingly known as sorting nexins or SNCs proteins. And I won't go through all of these different sorting nexin proteins that have been discovered um, with homology to one another, and, and many of them bind membranes and can sense membranes and even induce membrane curvature. One of these proteins that we're particularly interested in for a variety of reasons is called SNX17. Um, and the reasons for this are that SNX17, um, through the work of uh, Peter Cullen, and a variety of Dan Bilodeau and a variety of other labs um, um, have, have shown that SNCC17 seems to play a role in the recycling of various receptors back to the plasma membrane. Again, in a mechanism that isn't entirely clear, rather like EHD1. Um, so that, that kind of rang a bell for us. We've got two proteins, both in, involved at endosomes, and both play roles in recycling somehow. And so we were asking how SNCC17 mediates its interaction with a wide range of cargos. And this in the literature um, has been shown, and this is a, um, um, a study, structural study by uh, Brett Collins, um, who showed basically the three-dimensional structure, crystal structure of uh, SNCC17. And it basically has um, a PX or a lipid binding domain. You can see that on the right in the bottom area, binding to lipids in the membrane. And it also has what's called a firm domain, which has different lobes in it. But overall, the firm domain binds to receptor tails, to various sequences in receptor tails. In this particular case, it's a sequence uh, made up of NP, any amino, ac uh, any amino acid, and Y, a tyrosine, or N, any amino acid, any amino acid, tyrosine. So either of these two types of motifs. And receptors that have these motifs will interact many times with the firm domain of SNCC17. So it's kind of linked to the membrane in, in two different ways. And so what we're thinking is that the SNCC protein is able to interact at endosome, SNCC17, um, with certain receptors that need to undergo recycling based on this kind of interaction with their receptor tails. But there needs to be a protein that's involved in the fission of these vesicles, and basically, that brings us to our thoughts about EHD1. So we know that both EHD1 and SNCC17 control recycling, and we know that EHD1 depletion causes impaired recycling of a variety of different receptors. SNCC17 depletion causes impaired recycling of many of the same receptors. And since EHD1 
doesn't interact to the best of our knowledge with the majority of these receptors, maybe the SNCC 17 links EHT1 to these cargo to allow fission and their recycling back to the plasma membrane. And all of that brings us to the hypothesis that I'm going to take you through today is that we have a sorting endosome, we have a receptor shown in brown here, um, and we have the SNCC 17 allowing that receptor to be pulled into this budding region that needs to undergo fission. And perhaps the SNCC 17 is able to interact with the HD1 and maybe even recruit it to um, this region that needs to undergo fission. And EHD1 will release the vesicle for recycling back to the plasma membrane. So that's our hypothesis. And to answer this, we first asked, does SNCC 17 interact with EHD1? And we first resorted to immunoprecipitations. And we show here that um, SNCC 17, immunoprecipitation with SNCC 17 pulls down itself. And immunoprecipitation with EHD1 pulls down SNCC 17. And a control, EB3, doesn't pull down um, SNCC 17. It does pull down itself. And so this was the first indication that these proteins interact with one another in cells. And we next ask, do they interact directly? And to do this, we need to uh, first purify proteins so we can test whether they interact in a controlled environment. And we used his tag DHD1, which we purified, and that's shown in the left panel. Um, and basically, we used another purified protein, um, GST, as a control, and GST attached to SNCC17 um, as our experiment, so to speak. And what you see in the middle panel is that when we use GST, we do not pull down any SNCC17, but when we use G, uh, I'm sorry, when we use GST, we do not pull down any, um, um, I'm sorry, when we use EHD1 to pull down um, either GST or GST SNCC17, we do not pull down any GST, and that's the GST expressed there, we pull down nothing. Um, but when we use EHD1 to pull down the GST SNCC17, we pull down a lot of SNCC17, suggesting that these two proteins interact um, in, in, vi in vitro and that their interaction may be direct. We went on to try and characterize the domains that interact. And just very, very briefly to take you through this, what we showed again was that the EHD1, the uh, histag DHD1 beads, pull down GST SNCC17, but they also pull down um, the firm B, this region up on top on the middle left of the protein, and the um, firm C lobe. Um, in a, an experiment I'm not showing you here, we used the PX domain, which was purified and showed that that did not um, come down with the HD1. So we know it's the firm domain. Um, the whole firm domain apparently appears to be capable of, of binding. So what drives the HD1 to the endosomal membrane? This is a protein that's found both in the cytoplasm and on endosomal membranes. And very briefly, um, what we showed is that when we do an uptake experiment, we add ligand and allow receptors to be taken up into cells. Um, we basically see that the SNCC17 is already on endosomes for the mo most part. So you're looking here in C and D at the insets on the left um, at the endosomes that you can see um, containing SNCC17. However, when we look at EHD1, we see that there's really very little EHD1 on endosomes. There's some of it on endosomes, but when we add LRP1 uptake, uh, this is a, a low-density uh, lipoprotein-like receptor, um, what we basically see uh, is that more EHD1 is found um, on these endosomal structures, suggesting that the recruitment of EHD1 to endosomes occurs when um, receptors are taken up into the cell. And we can measure this um, by uh, doing quantitative microscopy. And as you can see in the left panel, the total EHD1 surface volume on these endosomal structures is dramatically increased when we do the LRP1 uptake. Um, it is increased a little bit um, for SNCC17, but relatively minor compared to the EHD1.
does LRP1 uptake increase the co-localization between the HD1 and SNCC17? We would expect that to be the case because if EHD1 is recruited to endosomes where SNCC17 is, we would expect more once EHD1 arrives at endosomes. So we did this experiment, and th what you're seeing here is the quantification, and we see more overlap between pixels that contain EHD1 and SNCC17 um, with the LRP1 uptake. Below is shown a um, representative image for how this looks. Now, these are three-dimensional slices that we've taken and used the Ameris program to essentially um, render them into surface volumes so that we can look at overlap of surfaces. So we're removing the non-membrane-bound cytosolic haze of these proteins. And what you can see with no uptake um, compared to uptake is that there's a lot more yellow shown on the bottom right compared to the top right, um, and and that it means that we're we're get, we're having more overlap between EHD1 and SNCC17 when we induce receptor mediated uptake. This shows you the 3D image um, with no uptake. So there is a modicum. The yellow pixels that you can see there represent the overlap. And you can see there's certainly a degree of overlap even with no uptake because receptors are always being taken up to some degree. Um, but when we do the uptake, um, you can see that there's considerably more yellow representing the overlap uh, of the surface volume between EHD1 and SNCC17. So does EHD1 require SNCC17 for endosomal recruitment? In other words, is SNCC17 the anchor for EHD1 on endosomes? And the answer to that is probably no. And we know that because we take mock cells, um, mock treated cells, and we do LRP1 uptake. And you can see that there's an increase in EHD1 recruitment shown in the inset on the right in panel B. Um, when we knock down the SNCC17, if the SNCC17 was needed for recruitment, we would expect in panel D to see almost no EHD1 being recruited. But since it is recruited, as measured here, you can see the increase um, compared to no uptake and the bottom graph is very similar to what you see for the mock um, same type of increase. And all of this suggests that SNCC17 knockdown has very little impact on EHD1's recruitment to endosomes, meaning it most likely doesn't recruit EHD1. So finally, if EHD1 um, regulates endosome fission, would we expect to see an increase in endosomal size if we deplete EHD1 from cells? And we used our CRISPR-Cas9 um, EHD1 um, knockdown cells and, and CRISPR-Cas9 EHD1 GFP tagged cells to kind of compare what happens um, in cases where we knock down EHD1. Um, so in other words, here are the kind of parental cells that you see here, the HD1 GFP cells. And you can see this is the, um, this is the level that you can see of SNCC17, the size of the SNCC17 endosomes that you see on the left here in the inset. And you can see with the knockdown of EHD1 that there are certainly some endosomes that appear to be of larger size in these cells. The gels here on the right basically show that these cell lines are indeed um, what we have. And finally, these graphs here are automated measurements that we've done of the mean interval of endosomal size plotted. And so the top graph shows the frequency. And what you can essentially see is that in the EHD1 knockdown cells, the mean interval of endosomal size is decreased or shifted a little bit to the right, indicating that the endosome size is typically larger in the absence of EHD1, um, basically because there's a, a failure to undergo fission. So these endosomes tend to just accumulate lipids but not get rid of them, and then they grow in size. If we do this uh, by relative frequency out of 100%, what you can basically see is the shift to the right is, is a lot more dramatic and we really see a, a pretty dramatic increase in endosome size as a result of EHD1 knockdown. So basically to summarize uh, our model for what I've shown you today, um, depicting the mechanisms for EHD1 recruitment is that when we have LRP1, this receptor um, bound to its ligand, uh, being taken up into endosomes, 
into vesicles or endosomes. Basically, um, the LRP1 re arrives at an endosome and is sorted by SNCC 17 to an area of the endosome that is budding and um, set to undergo fission back to the plasma membrane. And we think that this um, ligand binding somehow um, uh, releases signals within the cell that may um, induce EHT1 to be recruited to these endosomes. We don't know what the signal is, whether it's ATP binding, phosphorylation, dimerization, ubiquitylation. There are various different potential mechanisms that we're looking at now for recruitment of EHT1 um, to these endosomes. But the recruitment occurs by an EEIP or EHT1 or endosomal EHT1 interaction partner and not through SNCC17. But later, the EHT1 somehow is moved along the endosomal membrane where it comes into contact with SNCC17 and allows the fission to occur at this constriction region, release of this budding vesicle, and it's recycling back to the plasma membrane. So loss of either EHT1 or SNCC17 in this way would account for a um, retarded recycling of receptors back to the plasma membrane. And I'd just like to thank uh, all of the uh, people involved in, in the research that I have shown today. I won't go through them all, but I'll point out that um, um, the, the, one of the, the students that's been primarily involved um, in this most recent body of work, Kanika, um, um, has done a lot of the um, really important experiments in understanding how SNCC17 interacts with the HD1 to carry out these fission studies. And I'd like to thank the funding institutions for uh, providing us with the funding that we could do for this work. And I'll just finally say that um, if anybody is interested in learning about the lives of scientists in laboratories, um, these are four novels that I've written um, that deal with fictional characters at different scientific institutions in North America, and they're all available uh, by Amazon online if, if anybody shows any interest. Um, and thank you very much for your interest and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan, for that informative presentation. And we will now turn to the live q portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. So let's get started. We already have some great questions coming in. Dr. Kaplan, does the early endosome uptake clathrin form the coated pills? I'm sorry, the co coated pits. Uh, what's, I'm sorry, what's the question? What about the coated pits? Does the early endosome uptake clathrin form the coated pits? So the, the clathrin-coated pits are typically formed at the plasma membrane, and um, they uh, are involved, they're, they're recruited by a complex of proteins called the adapter complex AP2 proteins, and they form the, those coated pits that are internalized. Um, it's typically thought that these vesicles undergo uncoating, where the clathrin and the AP2 leave these vesicles prior to their fusion with the endosomes. And then at endosomes and lysosomes and at the Golgi, there are definitely reports that clathrin is involved in forming the initial budding structures that come out of those um, membrane compartments as well. Thank you so much. And is it possible to apply the TF flow assay to flow cytometry? Um, to, to apply which, which assay to flow cytometry? TF um, flow, the FLOO oh, the assay? Yeah. Transferrin assay that we were doing. Um, so flow yeah. cytometry is a, is a terrific method. Uh, I didn't show any data with that today, but it's a terrific method for quantitatively analyzing how much of a given receptor or ligand is taken up into the cell and sometimes also either degraded or recycled back to the plasma membrane because it can give you instantaneous information at different kinetic time points um, to tell you how much fluorescence you have within the cell. So typically labeled transferrin or fluor dye, uh, dye labeled transferrin 
taken up into the cell, what we will do is we'll take it up into the cell and then we'll measure how much fluorescence we have in the cell at that what we call the zero time point. And that's our 100%. So if the fluorescence gives us, gives us uh, a value of 1,000, then we allow the cells to um, just live in culture for another 10 minutes, 15 minutes, one hour. And at each time point, we can measure how much transferrin is left. And that will be a measure of how quickly the recycling is occurring. So if, if we started with 1,000 and after 15 minutes, we now have only 200, then we recycled 80% of our transferrin um, within that period of time because the transferrin binds very tightly to the receptor and they cycle the cell together as a complex. It's only the iron that the transferrin is bound to that's released in the endosome. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaplan. And again, I wanna thank our audience members for these great questions coming in. Our next audience member wants to know, do you think that yeast IRS and tax for are EHD homologs? That's an excellent question. And um, I really don't know. I mean, um, they, they do have some homology and there have been some reports that they may play roles similar to the mammalian EHD proteins in yeast, but they're not classic homologs in that they don't, um, I guess they, they don't have all of the domains that EHD1 has. I mean, if you look in plants, for example, which I don't know if they're farther away than, than C. elegans or not, I guess they are, they're plants. Um, they, they have the same um, domain architecture of EHD1, but they're reversed. In other words, the EH domain is at the end terminus and the GTPase is in the middle, and the ATPase region is in the middle and the helical domains are at the C terminus. So it's really the same structure. It's just kind of been flipped. Um, but the, the tax IRS proteins in yeast don't really have all of those same domains. So I'm not sure they'd be really exactly the same. Thank you very much. Now, many times polar residues are responsible for the specificity rather than the affinity. Do you think that the NPFs acidic clusters mediate specificity as well? And this is a two-part question. Perhaps the mutations make them no more specific for EHDs anymore? Well, I think, you know, I think that's a good question and I think it's, it's entirely possible. Um, and we don't even know, for example, what the um, specificity is between the individual four EHD proteins, EHD one, two, three, and four, all of them tend to, to prefer acidic clusters following the NPF motif. However, there are some preferences. So for example, the HD1 appears to be able to bind a wider range of proteins that contain um, NPF, EE, or DD motifs than, um, than the others like EHD4 or EHD3. And um, it, it's, it's interesting that slight changes in the, in the structure from what we know between EHD1 and the predicted structure of EHD3, because we don't have the full solution structure, may um, suggest that the one has a wider binding pocket and is, is slightly more capable of interacting. Now, having said that, um, it's not entirely clear that EHD1 can't bind you know, proteins that have an NPF motif with no um, acidic residue. There may be binding, but I think the, the affinity is much lower in those cases. And that's that's consistent with what we see from the titration, NMR titration, and what um, Jim Balecha saw with the uh, isoelectric, um, isothermal calorimetry experiments that he did. Thank you so much. And we have time for two more questions. Dr. Kaplan, do these EHD1 SNX17 endosomes colocalize with known early recycling endosomal markers, and are there other NPF proteins that localize with SNX17? Um, Great question. I'll start with the second part first. Um, yes, there are other, um, uh, there are other NPF containing proteins. Um, Rubenosin 5, for example, is a marker of early sorting endosomes, and it's also found in partial overlap with SNCC17. And there are others as well, um, and we'll go through them, but there are others as well. Um, the second question, or the first part of the question, if I'm not mistaken, was 
Um, are there receptors that are localizing with? Can, can you read again the first part of the question? I'm sorry. Sure, no, no problem. <clears throat> the question was, does these EHD1, whoops, I apologize, it just got moved. Do, do these EHD1 SNCC 17 indosomes co-localize with known early recycling indosomal markers? Okay, yes, absolutely they do. Um, it's, it's not a complete overlap or co-localization, it's a subset. So there are a number of markers, and I guess the second part of the question partially answered the first part. That's why I got confused. Rabenosin 5 is both an NPF-containing protein, it has five NPF motifs, it interacts with EHD1, and it also co-localizes at early sorting endosomes, in part with SNCC17 and with EHD1 at those structures. And there are a variety of other um, non-NPF-containing early endosomal markers that also co-localize with SNCC17. In particular, the retromer complex, um, which is a, is a whole complex of, of proteins that's found involved in sorting at early endosomes. It's a master regulator of trafficking, and it also overlaps. Many of the proteins that make up that complex overlap with, with SNCC17, at least in part. Thank you so much. Our final question, is SNCC-17 relate to recycling um, secretory RABs like 4, 11, and 8, or subcomplexes of the retromer or alike? Yeah, well, SNCC-17 has been, I, I'm, I'm not sure um, with the RABs um, exactly how the SNCC-17 and the RABs fit into the same um, scenario. It could be that Grab seven on endosomes may be involved in recruiting parts of the retromer, but at the same time, the SNCC 17 seems to be independent of the overall general retromer that, that people were studying up until a couple of years ago um, uh, and thinking that might be part of the SNCC 17 complex. It turns out there's another complex called the retriever complex, which is related to the retromer. Parts of the proteins are overlapping with those of the retromer. And this retriever complex is really involved in, in binding to SNCC17. And that's probably the more important pro, uh, protein complex um, that's involved in sorting. Dr. Kaplan, thank you again for your time today and for your important research. Before we go, I also want to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. And questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand for six months until March, 2021. Labrates will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, stay healthy, bye-bye.